On the last video, I began to explore the issue of the utilization of the scientific method for social concern, comparing it to other forms of governance and decision making, such as democracy, technocracy, and how the market forces influence those. The video received an overwhelmingly positive response from many of you, and I was really surprised. As expected, there were also a few questions and critiques, and I thank you for those. We shall explore each of them individually. One of the criticisms raised was that there is no universal definition of well-being. Therefore, we cannot possibly address the issue in scientific terms. Okay, let's examine this statement with the help of a graphic. Imagine we have two persons. The one on the left is in the quintessential perfect well-being. Now, we do not know what that looks like, but we can imagine a hypothetical scenario where such a person in such a state exists. On the opposite side, you have an unfortunate individual who is in the worst possible misery, both physical and mental. If you can imagine something bad in your life, it's there. And if you can imagine something worse than that, it's also there. Between these two conditions, there are millions of degrees of variation from left to right. Somebody here, for example, may have the following scenario. She never gets sick. She never broke a bone in her body. She can run a marathon and finish up with ease. She is generally very happy with her life and never displayed signs of depression or mental illnesses. She has a stable and balanced diet, as well as access to proper nutrition. She follows her interests with passion and she is intellectually stimulated. Her social relationships are strong and healthy. Her sentimental life is more than satisfying and she enjoys it thoroughly. Clearly, these are not all the best traits that one person can have and uh, it's far from being the ideal situation of well-being. It's just a point of reference. Similarly, a person here is in the following condition. She was never fed properly due to a lack of access to food. As a result, serious growing deficiencies affected her body and her mind. She is crippled and underdeveloped, both physically and mentally. She is constantly being abused sexually. Continuous tortures and harassment have worsened her condition over time. She is constantly in a state of pain. Whenever her body adjusts to a level of suffering, new pain is added and the torture continues. Due to the enormous amount of physical and psychological abuses, she was never able to create any social bond. She developed psychosis and she is mentally unstable. I could go on, but I think you get the picture. Now, it is true that we don't have a univocal and universal definition of well-being, but that doesn't stop us from recognizing that there are certain positions on this line that are more desirable than others. And these can be evaluated objectively and scientifically. But we still don't understand everything about the human condition, you might say. We don't understand everything about aerodynamics either, but that hasn't stopped us from building airplanes and move across the skies of the world. One could make a similar argument about life. Nobody really knows what life is, yet we can safely say that a rock is not alive, but a squirrel is. And what about corals and viruses and artificial intelligences? Yet again, there is a degree of possibilities within the line, and it's an open discussion. But when somebody stops breathing, grows cold and starts to decompose, well, that might be a sign that the person is not alive anymore. Surely in the future we might discover that we got it all wrong, that rocks are alive and we are not, who knows? But at any given time we have a context and a frame of reference, which we utilize to make an argument. This is not a philosophical discussion about the nature of truth in the realm of platonic ideas. This is a very practical argument, 
where we pose a question. Can we try and maximize well-being? And can we use a scientific approach to achieve this goal? And the answer is yes, in both cases. And given the disastrous results that politics and modern economics have given us, it would be utterly irresponsible not to do so. It really saddens me, the fact that even though we have an abundance of food and medicines in the world, millions of people continue to die. This is completely unnecessary and avoidable. We let economics and politics deal with this problem for far too many years, and they have failed. On 9-11-2001, 2,966 died in US soil. People still talk about how this could have been prevented. There is an intense debate about that. Today, 23,987 people, mostly children, died of hunger. There is no debate about that. We can prevent this holocaust that keeps repeating every fucking day. It's time to evolve.